Bachelor in Mathematics, if I can so that's right, in Chicago. Went on to do her um, graduate work in Princeton, working with more guys with Russian culture. Um, then she became a faculty member at the University of Colorado from 1980 to 2003, after which she moved on to Wisconsin, where she's now director of the Center for the Self Organization. She is the recipient, recipient of several prizes, including the very prestigious 2016 Maxwell Prize for Plasma Physics from the American Physical Society. So let's give her big readings and we'll be very interested to hear what she has to tell us about cosmic rays. Cosmic 
rays all along the energy spectrum. Uh, they're mostly protons. Uh, electrons are down by a factor of 50 to 100. The positrons and the antiprotons are uh, secondary particles producing collisions. Um, in the aggregate, they, in the Milky Way, they, they have about one EV per cubic centimeter, which is similar to the magnetic thermal and radiation energy densities. Um, beyond a, a few E EV, so E EV is kind of the 18 EV, particle gyro orbits are so big that they're not even confined to the galaxy, and they're generally thought to be extragalactic in origin. And these particles, these ultra high energy cosmic rays, are very mysterious and interesting, but they're not going to be the subject of this talk. The subject of this talk is the mildly relativistic cosmic rays, which really comprise uh, most of the cosmic ray pressure. So the dynamical effects of cosmic rays really come from the mildly relativistic ones. Um, their composition is, um, is fairly similar to what we have in the interstellar medium, but they're vastly over-enriched in the light elements. So blue is galactic cosmic rays, red is solar system, uh, going up to 40. And the usual interpretation of this light element overabundance is that these particles are produced by scalation reactions between carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, cosmic ray nuclei, and interstellar particles. And one can go from the measurements of these light element abundances to how much material the cosmic rays have passed through, and this is some evidence for kind of how they're confined in the galaxy. Although you can't really see very well from this image, there's a notable lack of elements that are formed in supernovae, our process nucleosynthesis elements, and this tells us that cosmic rays are most likely accelerated from the interstellar medium rather than directly from supernova uh, ejecta. Cells. Um, it's canonical lore that cosmic rays are very isotropic in the directions which they derive uh, arrive at Earth. Uh, this is from a TEV uh, up to the EEV. I'm not sure you can read this very well, but this is a tenth of a percent. So, iso so in a TEV, isotropic to a tenth of a percent, and the anisotropy increases as you go up in energy. Recently, um, some very small amplitude hot and cold spots have been discovered at TEV energies and above, and they really pose an interesting challenge to theory. They, they tell us something about sources and the way cosmic rays propagate. If we look at many galaxies, uh, there's this strong correlation between the synchrotron luminosity and the far infrared luminosity, which is thought to be root process starlight. So over many orders of magnitude, a very strong correlation. And this really hints at, at some sort of self-regulation between star formation, magnetic fields, and, and cosmic rays. And that is another motivation for looking at cosmic rays. So, to summarize all this, what can we infer? So, cosmic rays are accelerated uh, from the interstellar medium, not gradually over long periods of time, but in basically one time events. How do we know that? We know that because the most energetic cosmic rays are not the oldest, but the youngest. They have the shortest resonance time in the galaxy. They're at energies of about a GeV, they're confined to the Milky Way for about 20 million years, occupying the thick disk of the Milky Way. And from the isotropy, or the lack of anisotropy, we can infer that they're scattered with a short mean free path of about one parsec. So that's about a million gyro radii, but still very small compared to galactic scales. This is what gives us hope that we can develop a fluid theory for cosmic rays. And discounting the 99% of supernova energy that goes into neutrinos, about 10% of that 1% seems to go into cosmic rays uh, to keep them in a state. So this is a very brief introduction to the properties of cosmic rays. Okay, so how do they interact with their environment? Um, as particles, they give rise to these interesting emissions. Synchrotron and first 
Compton, Bremstrong, that's what the electrons and positrons do. The ions produce gamma rays, neutrinos, secondary electron positron pairs, light elements, and at the lower energies, they're a major source of collisional ionization and heating. So a lot of interstellar chemistry is actually driven by cosmic rays. So that's reason enough to think about them. But what we're going to concentrate on mostly in this talk is their collective interaction. And so on micro scales, that would be small kinetic instabilities. Um, on the sort of intermediate scales, the structure of collisional shocks. And on the very largest scales, uh, how they affect interstellar and intercluster gas. And we're going to talk about equilibrium instability and collisionless heating. Let me say a little bit about what we can get from these uh, particle interactions and how important they, they are. So basically everything we know about cosmic rays outside of the solar system comes from these, um, these radiators reactions. Here is, um, so here's the Fermi data. This is work by Andy Strong and his group. Um, the blue points here are the Fermi data. These are the components that go into that gamma ray spectrum. Uh, discrete sources, diffuse, inverse Compton, pions, Bremstrom. You can add it all together and you can do this in other galaxies too. So this is uh, Toby Yost Cole, former student of my J. Gallagher's a composite spectrum fit with, to both Fermi and uh, Veritas, higher energy gamma ray points, um, modeled by a very conservative set of assumptions of how cosmic rays are modeled and how they interact in the galaxy. And we can use this type of spectral modeling um, to look at, at partition, for example in galaxies. So it's often assumed that the cosmic ray and the net energy densities are about the same, although we don't have uh, a good theory for why that would be so. And um, here's a test of that assumption for um, the large batch of the cloud, M31 and Milky Way. So galaxies that are not strongly star forming, although there's some. Then the starburst galaxies, NGC 253 and N82, and then um, R220, this uh, pair of nuclei orbiting each other with a dense molecular medium. So magnetic energy density, cosmic ray energy density, this line is at the partition, and you can see that as we go up in star formation rate, um, the cosmic rays are not keeping up relative to the magnetic field. And this can be understood in terms of the gas density of the underlying medium. So here's the ratio of magnetic to cosmic ray energy density for the same objects uh, versus gas density. And you can see that there are really uh, kind of two lines that, that fit this. So what seems to be happening here is that even if cosmic rays are being accelerated, the gas density is so high that they're suffering extreme losses and just not keeping up with the magnetic field and um, the radiation energy density. So these remote diagnostics combined with spectral modeling are extremely useful in telling us what's going on. Okay, so now um, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be showing equations and I want to convince you uh, that we actually need so let's assume, and we'll justify later, that on sufficiently long scales, longer than the cosmic ray mean free path, which is kind of parsec, the cosmic rays behave as a fluid and that they're dynamically coupled to the thermal 
that cosmic ray driven winds, and we'll say, okay. So, um, let's consider this is work by Eric Becher, a uh, grad student in Wisconsin. Um, the, the, what supports the ionized gas in the edge of our galaxy, NGC 891? A very uh, intensively studied nearby edge on galaxy. So here is the um, here's the diffuse ionized component. And what supports this gas perpendicular to the galactic plane? So here's a breakdown of um, what different components can provide in the way of support. So this black line, this is a function of height and pressure gradient to different components. This is what we need to support the gas against gravity. This is what just the thermal uh, pressure alone provides. Obviously, way inadequate. Um, this is what the cosmic rays provide, and this is what the magnetic fields provide, and this is their sum. And you can see that if you add together um, all these different components, magnetic fields, cosmic rays, dynamical pressure, and thermal pressure, you can um, you can uh, get a an equilibrium stratified model, but the magnetic fields and cosmic rays play a pretty big role relative to the thermal gas. And the gas is that stable, and in particular, is it stable against the Parker instability? So the Parker instability um, goes back to 1966 in its application to the interstellar medium. Um, a similar problem was considered in 1961 by Newcomb, and the basic, um, the basic idea is that, so say here's the galactic plane, and there are some clouds, uh, and there's a magnetic field, a horizontal magnetic field, and now if we make a, an underlying perturbation of this magnetic field, the gas will be able to slide down the field lines um, into the galactic plane, lowering its potential energy, um, and that would be a preferred energy state. So that's the part of its ability. It's the tendency for gas, which is supported by a magnetic field and cosmic ray pressure, um, to want to fall down into the galactic plane. Now, whether this is actually energetically advantageous depends on um, how compressible the gas is, because you have to do work to get it into these, these pockets. And so the criterion for stability involves the compressibility index of the gas, and it also involves the compressibility of the cosmic rays, because you have to be able to squeeze those cosmic rays into the pockets. So how stable is our model? Okay, so there's a lot going on here. Let me try to explain. Um, this is the essentially the scale height of the magnetic field, going from 0 to 10 kiloparsecs. The smaller that scale height is, the steeper the magnetic pressure gradient. This tends to be destabilizing because the magnetic field is then like a light fluid supporting the heavy fluid of the gas. This number, uh, the filling factor of the ionized gas, basically tells you how strong, uh, tells you what the mean density of the gas is, and therefore how um, how strong gravity how strongly gravity acts on it. So the smaller the filling factor, the more you go to a situation where you have dense little pockets of gas, whereas the filling factor of one is a stable distribution. Um, because the, the gas is edge on, we don't actually know how far it is from the center of the galaxy. We only know the projected separation. So that's a parameter. And what this shows is the parameter space in which these models are stable. Now, if the cosmic rays are not coupled to the gas at all, gamma cosmic ray equals zero, none of these models are stable. In the white part of the plane, the stuff is not stable. If it's blue, it's stable for all these values of gamma. If it's green, it's only stable for the larger value of gamma. And if it's orange, it's only stable for the, large, for the largest value of gamma. In other words, the larger, um, the larger gamma is, the more the cosmic rays work against compression and the more stable the medium is. So, Parker's original analysis, done before cosmic ray hydrodynamics, and put, took gamma cosmic ray equals zero. Gamma cosmic ray equals four thirds, or one, makes a big difference. So this is the place where we have to ask, are the cosmic rays coupled 
greater than galactic winds. So these, this is just a spherically symmetric pressure-driven model comparing a gamma equals five-thirds gas in blue with gamma equals four-thirds gas in, in red. And the message here is that a relativistic gas, which cools more slowly, is more effective at driving the wind. It drives a faster wind, and um, that's all we can see from this model. It drives the wind at a higher asymptotic velocity. Okay. So, um, I hope I've convinced you that um, it's worth doing the work. So, how do we actually go about developing the fluid theory for cosmic rays? Well, particular to the magnetic field, um, it's actually pretty easy. Cosmic rays have no inertia, um, so their pressure gradient must be balanced with their Lorentz force. Jc is the cosmic ray current. Um, the gas has its own current, J gas, and the total current is just uh, minus the cosmic ray current is equal to the gas current. So when we put these things together, um, we find that force balance for gas involves the total current, J plus B, minus the cosmic ray pressure rate. So the force on the gas, so cosmic rays exert force on the gas through the Lorentz force. That's kind of the message. So that's how cosmic rays can support um, gas perpendicular to the magnetic field. Parallel dynamics is more subtle. And it depends on a concept called gyrovesical scattering. And the idea basically is this. Um, this red is um, a magnetic field line, and it has um, large-scale curvature, like so, and also tiny-scale curvature, like so. And this here in black is the orbit of a cosmic ray. And if you think of this being terrain, um, and the cosmic ray may be being a skier. So um, you can ski up and down, kind of long, uh, slowly varying gentle slopes. Your skis kind of stick. And if you have a kind of washboard, you make a snowmobile has passed over. You also you may feel a little bump, but you can basically stay on the terrain. But if you hit a place where um, there's a bump that's just about the size of your skis, that's where you get the big perturbation, right? That's where you get launched into the air. That's where I uh, don't land on my feet. Um, and that is gyro resonant scattering. And this is just um, a solution for the orbit of a particle under gyro resonant scattering. Um, a resonant particle uh, goes in amplitude, a non resonant particle um, basically stays where it is. So when cosmic rays interact with magnetic field fluctuations that have a scale over their own gyro radius, they have a very strong uh, scattering. Okay. We can estimate the scattering coefficient. So here's our zero order magnetic field, here's our fluctuation magnetic field delta V. It forms an angle delta theta, which is the order delta V over V. And the scattering frequency is the mean uh, rate of change of delta theta to delta t, and that is like a gyro frequency times delta v over v squared. So that's our scattering frequency. It's proportional to the gyro frequency and the amplitude of the waves that are doing the scattering. Okay, then here, uh, the subject bifurcates. So there are two versions from now on. Um, the first version is the classical version. And in the classical version, um, the waves that scatter the cosmic rays are actually generated by the cosmic rays themselves. And this is sometimes called the self-confined picture. And the alternative is that the waves are just present as part of a turbulent cascade. They have nothing to do with cosmic rays per se. We can call this the extrinsic turbulence picture. And this is what leads to generalized cosmic rays. So, the basis for the classical, uh, or the self-confinement picture, is the so-called gyro resonance streaming instability. And this tells us that if cosmic rays are, have a bulk motion um, along the magnetic field, which is greater than the alphane speed, they will gyro resonantly amplify um, any alphane wave, and this is 
and we can find the effect of the waves on the cosmic rays by um, deriving a so-called Fokker clock equation. So this is the zero order distribution. These are the wave fields. This is the perturbed distribution function due to the waves. And um, averaging all this actually leads to a diffusion equation in momentum space, which is mostly diffusion in, in pitch angle. In other words, diffusion with no energy change. And then this is the scattering frequency that we derive kind of geometrically. And then the, the energization, the diffusion in momentum space, is a word VA over C squared, a small number, relative to the pitch angle scattering. So we have this diffusion um, equation, and we can use it to derive an energy equation. And the energy equation um, is just what it should be. It says that the rate of change of energy density is equal to minus the divergence of an energy flux, minus the energy that is going into a uh, wave. So this is the cosmic rate, this is the growth rate, this is the intensity of the waves. So this is what it should be, um, but it's not very useful. Yes. You mentioned the pitch angle. The pitch angle of what? Oh, the, cos the cosmic ray. Sorry, I didn't define that well enough. So, let's see. If this is the magnetic field, then, and the cosmic ray has a velocity vector directed this way, then that's the cosine of the pitch angle. Um, okay, so this is what it should be, but it's not very useful yet. However, if we assume that the cosmic rays are scattered frequently, short as you pass, we can actually relate um, this component of the diffusive flux to the spatial anisotropy of the cosmic rays, and this turns out to be proportional to the growth rate of the streaming instability, and that leads to a very nice cosmic ray energy equation where, so here again, the rate of change of energy density, the divergence of the energy flux, and now what looks like a frictional heating term. VA, the velocity of the cosmic rays relative to um, the background, dotted with the cosmic ray pressure gradient. So this looks like, this just looks like frictional heating. And in contrast to what I showed you before, it's actually easy to implement. And all that matters is that the cosmic rays have a short and free path and that they're scattering from waves that they generate themselves. Okay? And um, no further, we can uh, derive equations for the waves themselves. Um, there's some um, sort of propagation terms, and then there's the audience dissipation. And what this equation says is that in steady state, the energy that goes into um, the waves from the cosmic rays goes into the thermal mass. So this really is the heating rate. Very nice picture um, developed. Um, I, I would have made an OLAP, um, sorry, I forgot, um, but high school and his collaborators uh, really developed this cosmic ray hydrodynamics model. So the, the essential ingredients are that the cosmic rays streak out the pressure gradient at the alphane speed relative to the thermal gas, they transfer momentum through the pressure gradient, they heat the gas, with this VA dot grad P rate. Uh, there's also a diffusion coefficient, which you can calculate by calculating the wave amplitude. And um, this has been applied to the structure of shocks, to galactic winds, to heating the interstellar medium, and nature cluster medium. So it's, it's a very lovely theory, um, especially considering that it's derived from kinetic theory. Okay, so let's do, go through some examples of what this theory can do. So here's some recent work. Uh, led by Josh Weir, who I just spent a few months here a couple of years ago. Um, so we imagine that we have a cosmic ray source over here, and the cosmic rays are connected uh, to this magnetic field, uh, which is mostly in a, hot, in a very hot medium, like the halo of the galaxy. But some of the cosmic rays, uh, or some of the magnetic field lines, thread through a cooler cloud. Okay, so what happens? This is, um, this is motivated by the need to understand multi-phase galactic winds. So we see both hot and cool gas and galactic winds, and can they both be driven by the cosmic rays? So uh, Josh was the first person to demonstrate uh, a so-called bottleneck effect that was first predicted by Skilling uh, back in 1971. So first we'll talk about the case with no cloud, and then we'll see what so this is cosmic ray energy density uh, plotted uh, from
start with essentially no cosmic rays, and then as time goes on, this front kind of advances into the medium and off the picture, and a smooth pressure gradient is formed behind the front. And you can show from the theory that you expect the energy density in cosmic rays times the alpha and speed raised to the gamma cosmic ray power uh, to be a constant, and what happens behind the front is that it does. It's very nicely conserved. So the cosmic rays have got the smooth pressure gradient, and they're coupled to gas in a way we expect. Now what happens if we put in um, a cloud, which is represented here by a density bond? And we're going to hold that cloud fixed. So because the density has a maximum, the alpha and speed has a minimum, and as cosmic rays begin to stream, um, begin to encounter this density maximum where the alpha and speed is going down, the cosmic ray energy density must go up. And so the cosmic ray pressure gradient, um, instead of being uh, in this direction, would, would tend to go up. That would mean that the cosmic rays are exciting waves where they stream up their pressure gradient. But we showed a few slides back that the growth rate is proportional to the pressure gradient itself. So the cosmic rays are not generating uh, waves anymore behind this uh, dispensing maximum. And in fact, the cosmic ray pressure um, goes flat behind the density maximum, here, 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 the same place. Uh, and the cosmic ray pressure just builds up in a one-dimensional model, just builds up behind the cloud. What does this do? Well, once the cosmic rays reach um, the density maximum and start to go down the density gradient, they re-engage, they start re-exciting waves, and they exert a force on the gas, and they heat the gas, both. And if, the ra if radiation uh, from the gas is weak, what happens is the cloud just gets eroded over time. So this would be the original density profile, and it just starts crumbling. But if radiation is um, if radiation is effective, the cosmic, the cloud gets heated and stretched out, but it also gets accelerated to the right. And in this model, it reaches a speed of about 100 kilometers a second. So a cloud which is dense enough to radiatively cool can actually be accelerated kind of from the middle by this cosmic wave.
oxygen 6. Uh, the black points represent the observations this is worked by Warren Wagner and collaborators. And our model actually is not too bad. Um, it's, it's competitive with the other best model, which is the time-dependent cooling model. So there may actually be something to this, and it's nice to have a way of observation and checking it. So the message is that clouds in galactic halos, the cosmic rays can play an important role in their support and maybe even draw them out in a wind. Okay, so why do we need to go to generalize cosmic ray dynamics? A couple of reasons. Uh, this is, so one is that the interstellar medium really is a turbulent place. Not all the turbulence is due to cosmic rays. This is a simulation of emitting turbulence by my colleague uh, Stas Bolingra. And basically what, um, what we need to do is we need to account for non-cosmic ray sources of waves. So we're going to generalize the equations to include waves traveling in both directions. Um, we'll define a composite streaming velocity, which is basically the difference between scattering by forward-going waves and backward-going waves proportional to the outlane speed. The pressure gradient force on the medium is unchanged. It's still the gradient of cosmic ray pressure. But the heating uh, is going to be different. So the heating will be W dot red P cosmic ray, not VA dot red P cosmic ray. And in particular, if you have balanced turbulence, so equal intensities of waves traveling in both directions, there will no longer be cosmic ray heating. This is an important difference with the other, from the other model. So we can keep track of the forward and backward going waves separately for cosmic ray driving and damping. Um, we can make a simple model where there's um, cosmic ray driving and damping and a source, and we can derive a simple um, expression for the transport velocity. So this is our W, and this is basically the ratio of the turbulent driving to the cosmic ray drawing and damping. So if we have a model of turbulence, it's easy to apply this to cosmic ray heat, uh, drawing heat and cooling. Okay, so we can go further. Um, we can consider the self-confinement model um, plus something that damps the waves. And there are several things that can do that. In a partially ionized medium, ion neutral friction can damp the waves. Uh, in a hot medium, a fully ionized medium, a process called nonlinear Landau damping, which is proportional to the amplitude, the energy in the waves. And the third mechanism, which I'll say more about later, is sort of shearing apart of these waves by larger uh, scale NHG waves. In order for excitation by cosmic rays to balance the damping, um, the streaming velocity has to be greater than the outlane speed. So we're going to introduce parameter f, which is the proportionality between the drift speed and the outlane speed. So in any given system, f should really be a function, but for now we're just going to treat it as a parameter. So let's see what difference it all makes. <coughs> so now I'll take you through some simulations of galactic winds that um, I worked on with um, Tejas Wyskowski and Cameron Mann. So this is, uh, these are very large scale simulations, um, heavily parameterized, uh, basically patterned for those of you who work on galactic waves after work by Salem and Ryan. So we, we, changed, we changed nothing except the cosmic air transport models. So here's the spatial domain, and here's the gas density in two different in this case, cosmic rays are produced here in the disk of the galaxy where you have a lot of dense gas in star formation, and they're assumed to be frozen to the gas. There's no transport relative to it. Here, they stream at the galaxy <coughs> relative to the gas. Um, you tell me which is the more effective way. Which one would you rather be part of this way? This is an effect that was noted um, by, by Christoph and his group uh, several years ago, uh, not with streaming, but with diffusion. And the basic idea is that if the cosmic rays are just stuck in the plane of the galaxy, there's just too much, too much gas, too much weight for them to remove. But with some transport, diffusion, or streaming, uh, they can make it up a little higher and undrive the wind. So will this give us working cosmic rays? Is this 
curve represents uh, cosmic rays frozen to the gas, not streaming at all. You can see that the star formation rate um, has a big peak, and then it comes down, and it becomes very small. There's no blue curve here because no wind is, is driven. The disk is puffed up a little bit by the cosmic rays, which went to star formation, but it doesn't lead to the launching of the wind. Green is out faint streaming, that equals one. Red assumes that the cosmic rays are streaming at four times the alpha speed, and black assumes that they're, that they're streaming at eight times the alpha speed. You can see that in every case, uh, the star formation rate comes down. Um, it doesn't come down as much for the high F models, and that's because the cosmic rays are not puffing up the densest part of the disk where the stars are forming. They're sort of easily being transported to higher elevations. And they're driving the wind, driving very effective mass loss. But, the, but you don't see a signature in the, in the star formation rate. So, so this was kind of a lesson for me that you can have positive feedback without necessarily driving the wind. Although, in retrospect, it's kind of obvious. Okay. So the treatment really matters. Which value of f should we use? Um, f should really be a function, not a parameter. It, it really makes a difference, and we have to do a better job. Okay. If we do have a galactic wind, um, whether it's driven by cosmic rays or cosmic rays are just in it, um, it will have a termination time. And the last thing I want to show you on galactic winds is some recent work by uh, my student Chad. Buster on cosmic ray acceleration at a termination shock and what happens to those cosmic rays. So here as a function of first central temperature and then mass loss rate in solar masses per year is the cosmic ray luminosity of a galactic wind termination shock. And it goes up to about 10 to 42 ergs per second. Now, what happens to those cosmic rays? These shocks, so these shocks occur when the dynamical pressure is about equal to the intergalactic pressure. That tends to be a long way from the galaxy, maybe one or two hundred kilometers. So do those cosmic rays diffuse back, or do they just keep going out into the intergalactic medium? So the colored points here represent the cosmic the luminosity of cosmic rays that come back. And you can see um, that compared to this plot, which is very colorful and shows you lots of cosmic luminosity, this plot is extremely drab, and it tells you that very few of these cosmic rays actually break back, which means that they just go pouring into the interrelation. So the cosmic ray luminosity in the Milky Way is about 10 to 31 ergs per second, and the cosmic ray luminosity of this galactic wind termination shock is about the same, maybe half the size. And so these cosmic rays just go pouring out into the RGM. And something I'm very interested in doing is figuring out what happens to them. Do they heat the RGM? Do they make gamma rays? Do they make neutrinos? Um, it's, it's an interesting population. Okay. So what a very well, I could, I could stop here if I could say a little bit about galaxy clusters. Okay. So, Christoph has worried a lot about this problem. Where are the cosmic rays in galaxy clusters? So, they're made in galaxies, they're made in active galaxies, they should be made, they should get out, because we know other stuff gets out of galaxies. So, where, where are they? The limits of the cosmic ray pressure in the cores of galaxy clusters are extremely stringent, and they're just not seen. So what distinguishes galaxy clusters from interstellar gas is that the plasma beta, the ratio of thermal to magnetic pressure, is, is very high. Uh, this will also be the case in intergalactic media, most likely. And um, what happens to the cosmic ray confinement theory uh, under those conditions? Uh, do you just excite alpha waves? If you do, how are they damped? Um, how fast do cosmic rays sweep? Um, how do they transfer their energy moment? Medium, and these are the astrophysical questions that go with these plasma questions. Can you heat the ICM with cosmic rays? Um, where do the cosmic rays come from in galaxy clusters? Um, and what determines the cosmic ray pressure profile in galaxy clusters? So, um, 
assumptions about the scale of the magnetic field of gas density, and you can see that beta is maybe as big as 45 or so, 47, and oh, it comes down. It's a few times. So it's not huge, but it's much bigger than the shallow medium, which is about one. So under these conditions, um, there's a very strong damping of waves, of hydromagnetic waves. If they just poke their heads out a little bit above theta equals zero. And the Landau damping rate um, will go as the square of theta, the propagation angle, times um, the square root of theta. So theta beta to the one quarter is the parameter of interest. So what should theta be? So the, the waves that we talked about, although I didn't stress this, are actually propagating parallel to the magnetic field. But in a turbulent magnetic field, that's kind of an idealization. It can't necessarily happen. So this is uh, a sketch of what the magnetic field in a turbulent medium might actually look like. There's some parallel correlation, like land parallel, but then the field lines uh, vary on a, a scale which is shorter, lambda perpendicular. And the wave that's generated by cosmic rays will, will travel along these curved field lines and inevitably develop some sort of propagation angle. And this uh, was characterized as a form of turbulent damping, uh, both by uh, Peter Goldbach and Allison Farmer, and also by Allison Zarian and Guron Yan. And it, if we treat it as a damping mechanism, it's, it's fairly effective. So here we are in the Allison cluster with a turbulent magnetic field, and the waves generated by cosmic rays are forced to acquire uh, delta theta. So if you calculate the land at a rate, um, the minimum theta will be the ratio of the parallel to perpendicular correlation lengths. And if we make the sort of standard assumptions that are going to cascade, land at parallel and land perpendicular are related this way. And that leads to a sort of natural land at rate, which is proportional to the square root of theta. And this is larger by the square root of theta to the conventional estimates for turbulent damping. That means that the cosmic rays can stream five to ten times faster than predicted by the turbulent damping alone, and this leads to quite high streaming velocities in the column cluster. So going back to those profiles. So the black is how fast cosmic rays can stream in the standard turbulent damping picture. But if we allow for this finite beta effect, they can actually stream a great deal faster. And this goes in the right direction for removing cosmic rays from galaxy cluster cores where they're not being seen. Um, something that seems to go in the other direction that I just started to think about and I'll just throw it out is that there's a whole lore now that galaxy cluster plasmas uh, have anisotropic thermal pressures. So P perpendicular and P parallel are, are not the same. And this leads to a modification of the alpha wave dispersion relation. So there will be some parts of the intercluster medium where the waves are faster than the alpha speed, those are the large P per, but others where they're slower, those are the large P parallel. And because beta is large, even a small difference between these pressures so the wave speeds become faster or slower than the alpha speed, and the composite speed is actually determined by the slower of the two speeds. And this seems to go in the wrong direction for getting cosmic rays out of cluster cores, and it's working progress. Okay. So if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that the cosmic ray interaction with the stellar gas is significant. It's a collisionless interaction and it's mediated by gyroscale plasma waves. And the details of this interaction matter. They matter to whether the, the interstellar medium is stably or unstable stratified, to whether cold clouds can be accelerated and eroded, and whether a wind is driven or merely pops up a gas light. And, as we saw in the last couple of minutes, 
whether there's an efficient cosmic ray transport in galaxy clusters. So, um, whether you're going to be a user of these results or whether you're going to derive them, um, I hope you found them useful and thanks for your attention. The nonlinear random energy is strong. 
my my impression of the yeah. So my impression for the divine mutual collisions is that when it's strong, it's so strong it wipes the waves out completely, and uh, they just don't have any problem with that. And that's um, that's an important case. It's not the case that it's But you did consider streams. So you did consider the full coupling case of all the waves. We consider the only thing which decouples in our model is the reversal of the cosmic wave. So. Here the clouds are assumed to be fully ionized. Um, the, so we had either perfect wave locking or the Thank you. 